Amen. Take your Bibles and let's, uh, let's make our way back to the book of Revelation. I listened to uh, the sermon by uh, Jordan last week. He always does such a great job, but I was kind of shocked when he started relaying at the beginning of his message how long we've been in the book of Revelation. It's been a long journey, but we're getting towards the end. And if you're like me, I read a book. I took a big book to read with me on vacation, and I I finished it. But I I normally don't like to get to the end of the book and read the end of the story, right? Especially if it's a fictional type of thing. Mine wasn't. It was autobiography. Auto. No. It was a biography, historical biography, which is my favorite kind of reading. Um, Everybody died in the end. But anyway... uh, Most people do, and we, but when you watch a movie, and if you, if you watch some reviews, there's probably some blockbusters coming out in the summer. I haven't been kind of paying attention. Maybe you have a favorite movie coming out, and so if you go to a review, they'll say, spoiler alert, right? So you read that, and then the idea, they'll break it, spoiler alert, either reading it or say it, The idea is if you don't want to know the end, how this ends, stop listening, close the book, stop reading, right? Spoiler alert. I want to give you a spoiler alert. Chapters 20, 21, and 22 tell us the very end of the story. But don't you think if God uh, didn't want us to know the end, he wouldn't have put it in his Bible. He wouldn't have put it in there. For some reason, he wants to spoil the ending. He wants us to know where everything is going and how it is all going to end. Now, you may, in this life, face like the characters in my biographies, historical biographies. There are ups and downs, and there are challenges, and there are all sorts of things that happen, and unless the rapture comes, we all die. It's part of our story. We know that. But for some reason, God wants us to know the incredible end of the story. And why do you think that is? I think that it is to to help us live freer, more freely, help us to live more victoriously, confidently, courageously in the life that he's given us. Because he didn't just give us a life and say, good luck. He said, I'm sending you out on mission. I'm giving you a responsibility. You use this 80 years or 100 years or 40 years or however much God gives you. He says, I want you to use that and sell out to me. And if somebody says, deny yourself, take up my cross and follow me, take it up and give me everything that you have in in your entire life and follow me. If somebody says that, you probably want to know what's the end of this story. Peter even asked that, and I'll get to this in a little bit. And so this end of the story, it, it is not a spoiler alert, it spoils us. It just, it en, enraptures us. It excites us about the future, and it frees us to live through the present in a victorious way. And so I hope that the end of the story This week and then the last two weeks, the next two weeks, we will be done with the book of Revelation. I hope this story excites you. Now, last week, if you weren't here, we had the second coming of Christ, where he returns with, I believe, the resurrected church, the resurrected saints. He returns in glory. And there's a place where it's referred to as the marriage of the lamb with the bride. Now, maybe you're just stepping into this study or you're unfamiliar with the Bible. Uh, the, The bride of Christ is the church, and so you can be a part of the bride of Christ by joining by faith into the, the corporate body of Christ. When you trust him, the Holy Spirit comes into your life and seals you, and you become a part of the bride. Whether you realize it or not, When you say, I do to Jesus, he's saying, I do to you, right? And you're kind of having a marriage. And we saw this marriage feast where Jesus returns and we see him face to face and there's this wonderful marriage of the bride 
and the groom. Now, chapter 20, however, is something interesting. It's very interesting. 15 verses that cover a thousand years. A thousand years and 15 verses, and you're thinking, it's gonna be a long sermon. No, it's not. 15 verses, a thousand years. But in, in a sense, in my mind, this is sort of the honeymoon period. This is kind of the honeymoon. This is when Jesus comes, he gathers the church, he resurrects the dead saints from the, from the tribulation time, those who died during the tribulation. He resurrects them, and then he establishes a millennial kingdom, a thousand-year kingdom on this current earth. And that's what we're going to see when we read through Chapter 20, I'm, spoiler alert, I'm just going to tell you what happens. He's going to establish a kingdom on earth and rule himself. And there will be people who do not die during the second coming or during the second coming or during the tribulation period who become Christians and they just walk right into the millennial kingdom just like they are. And there are people who like probably many of us who die before the second coming or we're raptured. We come back with Christ and we live in the millennial kingdom in our new resurrected bodies. And we're not going to be suffering with the ravages of sin and temptation and all that because we've gone through that resurrection and the sin nature is gone and our fleshly bodies are, uh, we, are we have a new resurrected body. So it's going to be this unique period of time. But here's, here's another thing you need to know. That is in itself not the final estate. That's not the final home. And so when I married Sarah, we went on our honeymoon for a week. We went over and, and, and to the Bahamas and had our honeymoon. And then we had planned, hey, we've got to somehow have a home. What's our home going to be like? So we had an apartment, right? And so we had planned and furnished the apartment. We came back and we, we went from this state, this in-between state of the honeymoon, we went into our final estate, which is our home. And then what we're going to see in chapter 21 and 22 is a new heaven and a new earth. So we're not there yet. Chapter 20 is a unique period of time, and there's some disagreement about how this exists and what it's like. But I'm going to give you my, my interpretation of it and some of the other options, but uh, uh, hopefully this will be of great encouragement to you. Let me tell you why I think this this uh, period of time, and let me read the first six verses to get us started and then tell you why I think it's so uh, crucial, crucial. It says, then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, and in his hand is a key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. This abyss, this bottomless pit we've heard about before, throughout the Revelation a couple of times we've seen them release dem demons and others from this bottomless pit where demons and these fallen angels have been jailed. Well, guess who they're going to jail to start this thing off with? The serpent. Look at verse 2. And he seized the dragon, the ancient serpent. This connects it to the Garden of Eden. This is the devil. He's making sure we know this dragon we've seen in uh, this, this uh, spiritual entity that's driving a lot of the wickedness and the uh, the national um, and geopolitical stuff that we've seen in the tribulation period. This dragon is the ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan. I mean, God didn't want us to get confused who this is. And he bound him, put him in jail for a thousand years in the bottomless pit. And he threw him into the pit, shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. Now, wait a second. What happens at the end of the thousand years? Well, after the end of the thousand years, Satan is going to be released for a little while. It's still not over. So this period of a thousand years is very unique, where at the beginning, Satan is bound and put into the bottomless pit. Now, in my mind, that makes us think that we're not in that thousand-year period right now. If Satan is bound right now in a bottomless pit, I'd hate to see it when he's unbound. He's got an awfully long chain, as one commentator said. But he's going to be released for a little while. Then we'll talk about why this is, I think, an important period of time. Then verse 4 says, Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge 
was committed. These are earthly thrones that are set up by God and God has given the authority and he's gonna seat people on these thrones. And he says, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God and those who had not worshiped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. I think he's speaking specifically here of those in the tribulation period who chose to follow Christ and lost their life as a result. He says, if you will persevere, even if you lose your life, he's saying through this text, you will be resurrected and have an opportunity to rule. Now verse five says, the rest of the dead, now these are unbelieving dead, the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. So you mean there's more than one resurrection? Yes, there is, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. But there is a final resurrection where every unbeliever, every every soul is eventually gonna be resurrected to face the judgment. Look at verse six. So here's this promise that God has made John several times, and he's making you. So here's a promise for you. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Do you share in that? That's a very good question. Over such as these, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for how many years? A thousand years. Allow me to ask the Lord to help. Father, this unbelievable passage requires clarity that only you can give. You have in it implied commands that I ask you would help us to live. Based on the thousand years we're going to study today, how do we live this year? Teach us. Help us have more courage, more boldness, more desire to see lost people come to know you more desire to be holy and righteous in the way that we live. Help us be what you need us and want us to be because of this chapter, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. One of the great reasons that this chapter is so special is it answers a prayer that many of you have been praying uh, sincerely for much of your life. Our Father who art in heaven, May your name be hallowed. Thy kingdom, what? Come. Thy will be done, where? On earth. We've been praying for this. And what we're going to see is when Jesus returns, he stays and he inaugurates a kingdom where his will is being done and, his, the, he, and, and, and ultimately, it is the beginning phase of fully answering this praise where heaven and earth merge. And that's what we're going to see in the end, is a new heaven and a new earth where the fully divine and the earth will come together in this incredible ending of our story. But right now, we begin to see some of the physical, literal answering of his prayer. Thy kingdom come. Now, not just that, but he's answering the prayers of the Israelites, and and he's answering, he's tying up the loose ends of a lot of prophecies that he made in the Old Testament. He made some really cool prophecies to Israel that I just cannot find the fulfillment of these prophecies just in the New Testament church. I think that they still await full fulfillment. Maybe you're praying like a politician, or you're praying for peace on earth. We sing about that. We want to bring all people together and that there would be a peace on earth. I mean, everybody wants that. Well, even God says it's going to happen. Look at Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 2. This is a promise to Israel through a prophet named Isaiah. It shall come to pass that in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord 
shall be established as the highest of the mountains and the most powerful of powerful. Mountains were uh, what ruled. You always put the king on the mountain. He says, Israel is going to be the highest mountain in the world, not literally, but in terms of power. Why is it going to be the most powerful? Because a divine descendant of King David, the Lord Jesus, will be ruling from this one place. And Israel has this prophecy uh, that I think is not just happening in the church. We have the spiritual rule of Christ, but I think one day there will be a physical rule of Christ. Why? Well, listen to this. Listen to this. Um, It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the other hills and other authorities and all of the nations shall flow to this mountain, to Jerusalem, to Israel. And many peoples shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge between the nations and shall uh, decide disputes for many peoples, not just Israel. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares. Now, why would you want to beat your swords into plowshares? Well, if the world's now at peace. You start doing this, and the spears and the pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. This is the dream of all who want to see peace. This is the prayer. Bring peace to our world. It has not happened yet. (laughs) There's also the ecologist prayer. I'm making kind of light of this, but... Has this happened? Isaiah 35, 1 through 2. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad, and desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus, and it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing, and the glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon, and they shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. The wilderness is going to come back to life in so many different places. There's going to be an ecologist dream come true. It's going to be a zoologist dream come true. Isaiah 11 says, the wolf shall dwell with the lamb. Don't try that. And the leopard shall lie down with the young goat. And the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together and a little child will be mixed among all of these wild animals, misleading them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young shall lie down together. The lion shall eat straw like an ox. So God's going to have to do something that's going to change the environment in some sort of way that um, he brings peace not only in the human realm, but in the animal world and the ecological world, and I just don't think that's happened yet. I'll give you a more proof right here, verse eight. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra. Parents, don't try that. <laughs> and the weaned child will put his hand into the adder's den, where that's another type of snake. No, sir, (laughs) not doing that. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. Now, you can, here's what you can do. You look at this and say, this is all symbolic. There's nothing really that tells us that's symbolic. It's a picture of a coming kingdom with Israel as its base that is, has worldwide impact. Now, does the church have that? Yes. Does the church enjoy these promises? Yes. But does it fulfill all of these physical promises that you see in in the Old Testament? I don't think it does. And so (laughs) there is a, this a thousand year period is a place where God ties up loose ends. The loose ends of some of these promises and prophecies that he made in the Old Testament. My favorite of which is the Habakkuk 2.14, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God 
as the waters cover the sea. Won't that be a great day? That will happen at the second coming. Jesus will come, the whole world will see Jesus, know Jesus, and Jesus will rule, and this will be a period of a thousand years. Why do I think it's this thousand years will really happen? Well, verse two, it says a thousand years. Verse three, it says a thousand years. Verse four, it says a thousand years. Verse five, until the thousand years are finished. Verse six, it says reign with him a thousand years. Verse seven says when the thousand years are expired. So this, we call it the millennium, which just means, I guess that's Latin, (laughs) y'all help me, thousand years. That's why we call it millennium, because it's mentioned a thousand years. Now, there are three different views as to this thousand years. There are those who would be amillennialists, meaning that this really isn't, the millennial kingdom is spiritualized It's not a literal time period or kingdom on earth that it's fulfilled in the church. So these are just a few of the views and you might find some some good-hearted Christians that are amillennialists that uh, it's not meant to be taken literally. But again, to do that, you'd have to basically replace Israel with the church and do away with a lot of those promises and say that it was all fulfilled through the gospel and through the church, and there are well-meaning people who believe that. But there are post-millennialists. This is the idea that the millennial kingdom will happen. It will be a literal kingdom on earth, but get this, that it is actually brought into being through the work of the church and the gospel that we are going to win so many people to Christ and the gospel is gonna change the hearts and attitudes of so many billions of people that literally there's gonna be a, a, like a, a, Christ will come back to earth when we've set up sort of this perfect kingdom through the church. Now, I think you see some of the obvious problems with that. The world is not becoming a better place. I wish it were. I was talking between services with someone. There may be reprieves, and maybe we have a revival and a return to Christ in our, in, in our nation or in our land, and we may see some great things happening. But the general, uh, the, 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 um, the direction of our world is not becoming more and more kingdom-like. And so I think post-millennialism is really hard to support through Scripture and through reality that leaves us with more of a premillennial framework of interpretation. What does that mean? Well, that means the second coming happens before the millennial kingdom, that it is inaugurated with the physical return of Christ. It's brought about through the second coming, and then it begins a period of time. Now, I guess you could say, well, Maybe that a thousand years after the second coming isn't literally a thousand years. Well, you can say that, but I don't know why you have to say that. It says a thousand years many times. And I think the thousand years is to allow God to do a number of things. I've already mentioned one of them, to tie up loose ends. Loose ends with the promises that he has made to Israel and even promises he made to some of his disciples, which we'll talk about in just a moment. But I think there are loose ends regarding people. What do I do with all of those who have never trusted Christ or rejected Christ and those who were martyred during the tribulation period? I made promises to them. This this millennial thousand years allows God, it is his way of fulfilling the promises, dealing with people, and then eventually he's gonna eradicate all of the problems of our planet. We're going to see that. Well, let's walk through this thousand-year kingdom very quickly. At the beginning, as we saw, Satan will be restrained. I don't think that's happened yet. I think he's being restrained. The work is being restrained through the church, through the Holy Spirit, but he has not been thrown into a prison yet with a chain and put into the bottomless pit for a thousand years. But let me just stop right here. Isn't it kind of cool we, we, I think we sometimes give Satan more credit that God sends one angel with a chain, wraps up the serpent, and throws him in a pit. It, I, I thought it might ought to take more than one verse to get Satan and throw him in a pit. 
One angel, one verse. You know what Satan's great strength is, is deception. He's deceiving the world. And the way he wins his battles in our life is not through his immense power, supernatural power. The way he wins the battle in, 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 his, in your life is he convinces you of things you shouldn't be convinced of. He'll convince you you're right about something you're totally wrong. He will convince you to allow a lot of stuff into your mind, into your heart that is just false. And you build a false gospel. You build a false idea of, 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 of how to handle your life. And so he works through deception. Can you imagine what a day it will be when the great deceiver is put in the pit? What will that be like? Talk about a breath of fresh air. Remarkable. Well, the second thing that we see happen in verse 4 through 6 is that risen saints are going to rule in this thousand-year kingdom alongside of Jesus. Now, Jesus is going to rule, but he gives, he subs out his authority through resurrected human beings and maybe even some human beings that live through the tribulation period. But he gives them authority. Why does he do this? Because he said he was going to do it. He said to Abraham, Abraham, I'm going to make your descendants in Genesis chapter 12. I'm going to bless the world through your descendants. And then he, he said, not only is it going to come through a particular people, Israel, but I'm going to bless the world through in a particular place. Deuteronomy chapter 30 is a promise that God had made. It's interesting in this text, it talks about a land. It says, if your outcast, Israel, are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there the Lord will gather you. From there he will take you. And this is made back during the time of Moses, this promise, and he says, but there may be a day where Israel is scattered and they've been sinful and they haven't loved me like they should and they're all over, I am going to one day gather you from the uttermost parts of heaven and I'm gonna bring you, look at verse five, I'm gonna bring you into the land that your fathers possessed that you may possess it and he will make you more prosperous and numerous than your fathers and the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God. Listen to this, he says, there is going to be a kingdom where the, all Israel that is left will be believing in Christ. I'm going to gather them in to their land. And, and resurrected Christians and Gentiles will be a part of this. But they, I'm going to gather Israel back in. I've made this promise. And I'm going to change their hearts through the new covenant, the blood of Christ. And look what he says. I'm going to give you a new heart. I'm going to circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring, verse 6, so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and that you may live. Can you imagine what kind of world that's going to be? God has made promises. He made a promise to King David. One of your descendants will sit on a throne and rule for eternity. We know that descendant is Christ himself. But here's one promise I want to leave with you and make sure that you... He looked, Peter came up to him one time, one of his disciples. And Peter asked the question they were all thinking. Maybe you're thinking this question too, and I think it's legit. What's in this for me? You're asking me to give up my fishing boats, to take up my cross and follow you, my family. You want me to sell out to you, Jesus. And listen to what he said to Peter in Matthew 19. Verse 27, Peter said, see, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Jesus said to them, truly I say to you. This is so important. He didn't look at Peter and say that was a bad question, a dumb question you should have never asked. That's a spoiler alert. You don't want to know. He said, no, Peter, I want you to know what's going to happen. I say to you in the new world when the son of man will sit on his glorious throne you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel that has not happened 
And Jesus made that promise to his disciples. And I think the thousand years is an opportunity for God to tie up that loose end. And in some way, these apostles will be resurrected along with the rest of the church and will have opportunity to lead joyfully their own people. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. A thousand years is going to be an opportunity for God to bless the people who chose to follow Christ and to fulfill the promises that he has made that Israel would be a light to the world. I get excited about this kind of world. Um, one of the commentators that, that I read, because he writes so well, English guy, let me just, let me just read what he says about the, the millennial kingdom. The golden age has come. The armies of heaven have been disbanded. I mean, the armies of the nations, not of heaven. The armies, armies of the nations have been disbanded. No more Marines, no more army. Well, there'll be those, but I think they'll just be social clubs. No need the guns. The machinery of war will have been melted down and converted to implements of farming and construction. Jerusalem has become the world's capital. The throne of David is there, and the 12 apostles are judging the 12 tribes of Israel, for Israel rules the world. The millennial temple has been built to crown Moriah's brow, and the nations of the earth come there to worship the living God. Prosperity is evident from pole to pole and from the new river, which now graces Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. Poverty is unknown. Every man has all that his heart can desire. There are no prisons, no hospitals, no mental institutions, no barracks, no saloons, no houses of ill repute, no gambling den dens, no homes for the aged and infirm. Such things belong to the past and a lesser age. The bloom of youth is on everyone's cheek, for a man is a stripling at a hundred years of age. Cemeteries are crumbling relics of the past, and tears are rare. The wolf and the lamb, the calf and the lion, the cow and the bear, the child and the scorpion are all at peace. Jesus has come, and the millennium is here. The golden age so frequently heralded by the prophets of past has dawned at last and the earth is filled with the knowledge of God. Jesus is Lord and he rules the nations with a rod of iron. His reign is righteous and the nations obey. The principles of the Sermon on the Mount are the laws of the kingdom and men obey them because infractions are not allowed. Sin is visited upon sw with swift and certain judgment. The era lasts for a thousand years. Y'all believe that's true? It's in the Bible. Jesus made a big deal about it. Jesus promised his apostles. That's where it's heading. You say, well, what does that mean for me? Again, knowing our future sets us free. We married Jesus. When, when Sarah and I got married and when I do weddings, we have these two-sided vows. So you get married, you say, for richer or for? In sickness and in? For better, for? But when you say I do to Jesus, there's no worse. It's just better. There's no sickness, it's just hell. Not talking about this life, talking about the next, talking about a new world, a new life. Don't think that we just die and we go up and we get wings and we float around in heaven singing with our harps forever. That is not the picture the Bible gives us. It is a renewal of life in resurrected bodies the way we are meant to be and God is gonna restore that and we don't deserve it. It's by his grace that this happens. We do nothing to earn it. To prove that point, this next part happens. Look at this next part, it's really bizarre. So 
throughout risen saints reign, but then in the end, Satan's released again, and guess, guess who joins in with Satan? Well, there will be people who move into millennial kingdom who are not resurrected, who have sin natures because they survive the tribulation period. Not everybody dies at the second coming of Christ and they move into the millennial kingdom and they have sin natures and they have children. I believe there will be a reproduction in the, uh, in the kingdom with the human beings that are left. And so what happens? Sin is still there. Sin is still present in the world. There are problems. There's still a loose end. It's called sin. Uh, went to the beach last week. You get so excited about a beach vacation. Every year, you know, I don't know if you go to the beach. How many of you love going to the beach? Raise your hand. I, all right, how many of you would rather go to a lake? You don't really like the beach. All right, well, I've got some people like that. I bet you lake people. I bet I know why, because this is what I, I like the beach, but I put up with the sand, right? Three things I battle all week. Sweat, sunburn, and sand. And sand is the hardest of all. I mean, everywhere I would sit or walk, it seemed like I left a little pile of sand. It just sticks to you. You can't get it off of you. It gets in your shoes. And the worst part is you get it in your car and you vacuum and you get home. You're trying to get the sand out. I've already done my sand, getting, getting the sand out. I did that. But the sand is everywhere. The problem with this millennial kingdom is people come in with sand stuck to them. And it's called sin. You just can't get rid of it. It is a sin brokenness and a sin nature that still is present. And when Satan is released, he takes advantage of that broken nature among the, the, uh, uh, the human beings that are there and leads another final rebellion. A couple of things I think you ought to take from this today. I think God allows this to happen to demonstrate once again our desperate need for salvation and the brokenness of humanity. We sometimes think we've got our act together so well that if we just had a perfect environment, oh, we would never sin. It's someone else's fault. It's just, it's just the environment. Well, once again, they're living for hundreds of years under the reign of Christ and the lambs and the lions are getting along, but they fall in deception to Satan and lead a rebellion against the Lord. Now, don't they remember chapter 19 where Jesus came back and with the breath of his mouth destroyed the Antichrist and all of his armies in Armageddon? Don't they realize this is futile? Why would they do this? Because we are easily deceived. We are easily deceived, and so we need to know the truth and make sure that we saturate our minds and hearts with the truth so that we are not led astray. I think it demonstrates once again. But, but why would he do this? Because I think it demonstrates his incredible, incredible grace that another thousand years of grace has continued. And God just has been patient and patient and patient with his people and with you and with I and with me. Finally, look at verse 7. I'm running out of time, but hang on. You need to hear the end of this story. When the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released, will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, all over the earth, Gog and Magog, to, to, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. Talking about sand. And they marched up from the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, but fire came down from heaven and consumed them. Not much of a fight. And the devil who had deceived them, God's going to tie up one of his final last ends, uh, loose ends. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur with the beast and the false prophet were and they will be tormented day and night forever. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Deliver us 
from evil. He will. He will eventually deliver us from evil. Lead us not into temptation. One day the tempter will be thrown into the lake of fire. So he's going to tie up these loose ends. Can I encourage you to be careful and more patient with one another? Seeing these people rebel, even with Christ ruling down the street, We tend to complain about each other a lot. We tend to think if we just had a better environment, we'd be better people. Maybe you turn that towards your spouse and say, well, if I had a better husband or a better wife, I'd be more faithful. I'd be less selfish. I'd be more attentive, more loving. No, you wouldn't. It's not, it's not your spouse. It's your heart. You say, well, um, if, I, if I made more money and I had more money, I'd start giving. I'd be much more generous. No, you wouldn't. Don't fool yourself. Your generosity is not connected to your amount of money. It's your heart. You say, well, if I had a better church or a better preacher, I'd be more faithful. No, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. It's your heart. Well, if I, if I was more courageous and knew the gospel better, I'd share Christ with more people. Stop making excuses. Your environment's not the problem. It's your heart. And God proves it once again at the end of this thousand-year millennial reign. He says, does this make us feel condemned? No, it makes us feel grateful that he comes to a people like us and he invites us into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. And he gives us his Holy Spirit to help us overcome our weaknesses. And he gives us his Spirit to help us love our neighbors more and help us want to share our faith better and help us put up with the sandiness of our other saints and the sandiness of people in our lives. And, and, and it makes us more patient. And, and so he graciously comes into our lives and helps us deal with the sand that sticks to us he didn't just leave us he loved us now let me finish with this the final few verses of this chapter are pretty frightening But you have an opportunity to rewrite the end of your story. You have participation in how this ends for you. So let's read this together, and then I'll pray. Then I saw, after Satan is thrown into the lake of fire, the problems are dealt with. God still has one gigantic loose end to deal with what I do with all the people who rebelled against me who did not receive my love and my grace and who rejected me time after time after time the dead what do I do with all of the souls that I made Well, we know by chapter 20, God has offered grace. Nobody's ever going to stand before God and say, God, you were just not fair to me. You just didn't give me opportunity. Nobody will be able to say that. But God is just and he is loving and every soul will meet its maker and face judgment. And this is it. This is the great white throne judgment. And if you're an unbeliever, if you're an unbeliever, this is, this is your final spot. If you have trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior, your judgment happened on a cross. 
2,000 years ago. And your judgment was put upon the divine man, Jesus Christ, who bore, took your guilt and shame and turned and gives you the, the, the righteousness you uh, did not deserve. My judgment happened there. I'm going to be judged for the works as a steward of my life at a, at a, when I go to meet God when, at the, at the uh, Bema judgment seat. But this is the great white throne judgment. No believing person who's trusted Christ will be there. But it all, it's a frightening thought to think of the billions. I don't know how many. I don't, maybe God in his graciousness has done things we just don't know, but I know you can write this ending for yourself. I saw a great white throne and he who was seated on it and from his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. What, was, what does that mean? There's nowhere to hide. Remember earlier in the book of Revelation, they were crying out to the mountains and the rocks, cover me. They didn't want to see the judgment. God just gets rid of all the rocks, gets rid of everything, and says, you face me. You did not want a God. But there is one, and I am that God. Now let's talk. But there's not going to be much of a discussion. What happens at that great white throne? I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. And then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. This is obviously symbolic. I don't think God's got a, a library indexed by alphabetically. But he does know in his sovereignty, in his books, all of your thoughts, your words, and your deeds. And people would, I think maybe some here, would say, all right, I'm willing to stand for that. And you balance them out. I'm willing to take my chances. I have been a much better person than the majority of people. That's not how it works. If there's rebellion in that book, if there's sinful thinking in that book, if there are deeds that did not please God, that were against God, that rejected God, you are convicted where you stand. You've rebelled, and the wages of sin is death. Verse 13 says, And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each, of, each one of them, according to what they had done. And death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. Now, why is that good news for us? Well, death, we know that's good news. You went on a dive, but Hades is kind of where you went uh, waiting for the resurrection. Well, there's no more need to have a waiting area for the judgment, the judgment, this is it. It's the final chance, the final place of judgment. Your chances are gone at this point. And God just throws the whole thing into the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Where does this leave us, church? Leaves me with three things. I just want to encourage you. I think we should encourage one another. We can live as Christians just freely and joyfully, even in the midst of trying difficult times, because we know the end of the story. And we know that by being good stewards of this life, Jesus told the good steward, because you were faithful in little, I will make you faithful in much. And so you're living for this, this wonderful future and this, in, the, in this current, you have the peace of God and the presence of God in your life. Live freely. I think we encourage one another. And I think we gotta evangelize unbelievers. He has put 
the responsibility in our hands to tell people the gospel. It is their only hope of salvation. We've got to share this. And I think we need to examine ourselves. As believers, we need to examine ourselves to see if we're being good stewards of this life and this grace He's given us. And if we're unbelievers, do you really want to stand before God without hope? You don't have to. Jesus says, all who come to me, I will not cast out. Anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You can trust Christ today. Let's pray together. I thank you, God, for this uh, very patient, listening congregation. And Father, I pray that they would be encouraged by this incredible truth. But help us, God, to share the gospel. We want our friends and our families and our neighbors to know there is a way of salvation. And I pray that everyone here today would examine themselves. Maybe, God, we're just not living the way we should. We're not taking advantage of the grace that you've given us and the, the talents and the uh, abilities that you placed in us. We're not using them for you. Maybe, God, we need to just more fully surrender our lives completely to you as believers. But God, maybe there are some here that have not trusted Christ. I pray that they just place their faith in you, that they would confess their sin, their need, and and just ask for the gift of eternal life. You give it freely. I pray that you move on our hearts, God. Make us the church you want us to be for these final days. In Christ's name, amen.